Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing acetylcholinesterases and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Right, so uh, we are having a discussion of the uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor which we find at the neuromuscular junctions. Okay, so we've seen that the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is made up of these five separate subunits, okay? And we've seen that each one of these subunits has uh, this sort of a membrane-spanning topology. So, let's now have a look at uh, what a cis loop actually is. That's what I promised to tell you. Right, so a cis loop is a loop in the polypeptide that is held together by disulfide bridges between cysteine amino acids, hence the name cis loop. It's a loop which is held together by cysteines. So, let me make this crystal clear by actually drawing one for you. So, if we have this cis loop drawn up bigger. So here's the polypeptide, so this, repre this line represents a huge number of amino acids polymerized together. And let's say we just happen to come across a cysteine amino acid here. So here's our amino acid, sorry, here's our amino group of the amino acid. Here's our alpha carbon with the hydrogen off it. Here is the R group of the cysteine amino acid, which has this methylene group, and then it would have a file group here, a sulfur bound to a hydrogen, but instead it's going to be part of a disulfide bond, so it's going to have lost that hydrogen. So I'm not drawing the hydrogen because I know what's about to happen, basically. It doesn't have that hydrogen on. Okay, so I'm just being fortuitous. Right, so then the polypeptide continues, and I won't draw every single amino acid. Instead, I'll just draw a line to represent many amino acids. And then it curves back round like this. And then what will just happen to happen is you'll have another cysteine amino acid here. So here's the amino group, the alpha carbon, with the, another R group, with another cysteine R group here. So here's the exact mirror image of this, and those two will be linked together. And I'm sorry, it's a little crowded at the bottom here, squished in. I'll move it into the center so that the camera gets as good a view as possible. And then here is the carboxylic acid group, and then it will continue on. So, the important thing is here, which I'll highlight in turquoise. This bond between these two sulfur atoms, this is what's known as a di sulfide bond, or a disulfide bridge. So disulfide bond slash disulfide bridge. They're both names that are commonly used. Okay, so you've got this loop in the polypeptide structure held together by this disulfide bond or bridge. This is what's called a cis loop. So these amino acids that are taking part in the disulfide bond are cysteine amino acids, and the free letter amino acid code for cysteine is CYS. Uh, another little bit of information, the single letter amino acid code for cysteine is C. Um, so this is why these things are called cis loops, because they are loops that are held together by cis, or cysteine. <coughs> Sorry about that. Right. Okay, so that's why nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are known as cis loop ligand-gated ion channels, and ligand-gated ion channel is often abbreviated to LGIC for short, ligand-gated ion channel. Right, okay, now, that's great, but what are the actual subunits that you can build? What are the, sorry, what are the actual subunits then? Which genes code for these subunits? And is there just one gene that codes for this subunit? Well, the answer is no. And it's quite blatantly no, because you have more nicotinic acetylcholine receptors than just the ones that are on skeletal muscle cells. So, then this is where it gets a little bit nightmarish, the pharmacology of this. There isn't just one gene for these uh, subunits that can make up a pentamer, uh, which is a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. There are instead, wait for it, 17 genes which code for... Um, the subunits that make up nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Now, to make these comprehensible to us, we have put them into families. So we have the alpha family, which contains 10 separate genes. So it contains the alpha 1 gene, 
the alpha 2 gene, you might just get the hang of the pattern here, the alpha 3 gene, alpha 4, all the way up to alpha 10. So there are all those 10 genes. And each one of these is a separate gene which will have a separate little sequence of organic bases which will code for a protein with a di slightly different sequence of uh, amino acids to the next one. And they all will make their own little proteins, but they are similar enough that they all have this uh, same membrane-spanning topology and they can be used to, as a fifth of a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Now, that's only ten so far. What about the other seven? Well, there's another family known as the beta family, which has the beta-1 gene in it, the beta-2 gene in it, beta-3, and beta-4. So it has four genes in it. So that takes us up to 14. Finally, there is also the gamma gene, the delta gene, whoops, and now where am I going to put the last one, and the epsilon gene, and that takes us up to 17. We have 10 alphas, 4 betas, and then the gamma, delta, and the epsilon gene, that takes us up to 17. So all of these are capable of creating a fifth of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So the question now is how do you assemble these into pentamers? It would be really nice if it was really simple, i.e. you could make one pentamer where you use alpha-1 in all five of these, and that's it. Then you can make uh, another one where you put alpha-2 in all five of these, and then finally you can continue on, and that will give you 17 different nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, one for each gene. Basically, that would be very nice and simple, but it's not that way. Those, that concept of making a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor where all five of the subunits are the same uh, is what's known as a homopentamer. And there are homopentamers that exist. For instance, the alpha-7-5 homopentamer, where you take uh, five alpha-7 uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor subunits and join them all together, stick them all together to make an alpha 75 homopentamer. That's really important in the brain, huge expression of that in the brain. But you don't see the other homopentamers expressed uh, that much, basically. And also, they're not the only things that you can build. Instead, you can also mix and match where you have different subunits in the different positions. And this these structures where you have different subunits are known as heteropentamers. So hetero means different. So you have different subunits in each of these different slots, okay? And that is what makes this subject complicated. Right, so which, uh, which subunits do you use in the skeletal muscle form? Because we're not interested in the whole lot of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Good gracious, there are a huge number that you could make. We're interested in the type that is within skeletal muscle cells. And there's only one type in skeletal muscle cells. So that makes it slightly simpler. So let's now go on to another page and study this type that is in skeletal muscle cells. Okay, right. So... Which type is in skeletal muscle cells? Well, basically, it's a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is called the alpha-1-2, beta-1, delta, epsilon, heteropentamer. So, let me show you uh, the structure of this alpha-1-2, beta-1, delta, heteropentamer. So, if we look at the channel from above, so imagine you are a little man sitting in the extracellular fluid and looking down at this channel what would it look like? So here's the pore, and it is made up of five separate subunits. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, now, this tells us what the subunit composition is. You have two alpha-1 subunits, a beta-1, a delta, and an epsilon subunit, but that doesn't tell you how to position them relative to one another. So what's the positioning relative to one another? We well, put the alpha-1 here and the alpha-1 here. You then put the uh, delta here, the beta-1 subunit up here, and the epsilon up there. So that's the positioning of them relative to one another. Right, now, the acetylcholine binding sites then, in this receptor, they are between 
uh, neighboring subunits. So you have an acetylcholine binding site between this alpha-1 and this delta subunit, and you also have an acetylcholine binding site in the cavity between this alpha-1 and this epsilon subunit. So let me color this in to make it look more exciting. So, in blue here, these are the acetylcholine binding sites. Okay. In red, we'll have outlined the alpha-1 subunits. Okay, here. So we've got two alpha-1 subunits in the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that is expressed in skeletal muscle cells. In green, we'll have the epsilon subunit, which is wedged in between these two alpha-1 subunits. Okay, here. And in orange, we'll have the delta subunit, which is over here. Okay, and then finally, we'll have the beta-1 subunit, which is in purple, right up here. And this doesn't take part in any of the binding sites, at least not in the alpha-1, 2, beta-1, delta, epsilon, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Right. So this is the form of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that you have within the skeletal muscle cells. Excellent. Now, what's going to happen is when the presynaptic neuron, which I'm going to redraw out now, because we've moved on to a different page. So when our presynaptic neuron releases acetylcholine, what's going to happen is the acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft, the gap between uh, the presynaptic axon terminal and the sarcolemma here. And it's then going to bind to these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which now I'll just draw nice and simply like so. Okay? So in turquoise here, this is this alpha-1, 2, beta-1, delta, epsilon, heteropentama, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And by the way, I should just mention that this is the adult form. I'm assuming we're talking about an adult here. If you are in the womb, if you're a fetus, you don't have this form in your skeletal muscle cells. Instead, you have uh, a form known as the alpha-1-2, okay, beta-1, delta-gamma form. So it's not too dissimilar. You haven't changed it radically, but you have replaced this epsilon subunit with a gamma subunit there. Okay, but that's the fetal form of this rather than the adult form. So in us, in us living humans, uh, well, so, sorry, that's awful, um, awful biology. In us adult humans, um, th this is the form that will be uh, in the skeletal muscle cells. So it has these two acetylcholine binding sites, and uh, acetylcholine, once it's diffused across the synaptic cleft, will bind these two binding sites on the uh, post, on this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, the acetylcholine receptor will open, and then what will happen is it will allow sodium ions to move into the cell, which will depolarize the cell and begin an action potential along the sarcolemma, which will cause contraction. Okay, so the stimulation of the acetylcholine receptors, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, is going to lead to the contraction of the skeletal muscle cell. Right, now I want to discuss acetylcholinesterases because the question is, this um, axon here, axon terminal here, uh, this alpha motor neuron, has released the acetylcholine onto the uh, skeletal muscle cell. But what's going to happen next? Is the acetylcholine just going to remain there forever, stimulating the myocyte for all eternity? No, is the answer. You want the skeletal muscle cell to contract when the acetylcholine first arrives, and then you want the signal to be killed. You don't want to be giving a continuous signal to contract. That is not good. So you need to terminate this signal. You need to destroy the acetylcholine that has been released. So how is this done? Well, it's done by enzymes which are within the synaptic cleft, uh, known as acetylcholinesterases, uh, about which this entire video is based. So acetylcholinesterases are often abbreviated to ACHEs for short, acetylcholinesterases, and they are enzymes. Okay, so let me show you now the structure of an acetylcholinesterase enzyme. So, basically, acetylcholinesterase enzymes, we will just note them basically as a little blob, but they don't just exist on their own. 
Okay, so this is an acetylcholinesterase enzyme, but they actually assemble into much larger structures that they work in. So what happens is they assemble into a structure which I will draw like this. So let me put these all together. So what you form is these tail structures here, okay? And these are what no are known as the collagen-like tails of acetylcholinesterase enzymes. So this is the collagen-like tail, okay? And this is basically made of protein, okay? And it's also known as C-O-L-Q, col -Q for a collagen-like, and then God only knows what Q stands for, but basically, this is the protein that makes up these tail structures here, okay? Right, now, also what happens is that you have certain regions on each of these proteins, these collar Q proteins, so here are these regions here, which are known as the proline-rich attachment domains, okay? And these are where the acetylcholinesterase enzymes are going to attach. So these regions here are what are known as the proline-rich attachment domains. And proline-rich attachment domain is often abbreviated to P-R-A-D, PRAD for short. So this is the PRAD of these Col-Q proteins. Okay, so PRAD. Now, what you're going to do basically is attach acetylcholinesterase enzymes to the Col-Q collagen-like tail of, um, well, these Col-Q collagen-like tail structures. Um, and that is going to make this whole structure. So we've already got three of these Col-Q proteins assembled together, okay? And this is known as the trifold arrangement. So trifold arrangement of the Col-Q protein. So let me summarize. We make this Col-Q protein, which is one of these. So let me highlight a single Col-Q protein. So this is a single Col-Q protein. You assemble Col-Q proteins into this trifold arrangement. So you put three Col-Q proteins together. Each of the Col-Q proteins has a proline-rich attachment domain, and acetylcholinesterase enzymes are going to attach there. Now, not just one acetylcholinesterase enzyme binds. Instead, four bind. So let me show this. One, two, three, four. One two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Right, so let me colour these all in. So we'll have the acetylcholinesterase enzymes in red here, and all of these are little acetylcholinesterase enzymes, so they're all proteins capable of breaking down acetylcholine. So you assemble four of these onto each of the proline-rich attachment domains of each of the Col-Q proteins in the trifold arrangement, which means that overall you produce these um, structures which have 12 functional acetylcholinesterase enzymes on them. And these are going to be in the synaptic cleft. Now, they are not just free in the synaptic cleft. Instead, they are attached to structures which are in the synaptic cleft. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.